Christianity has spread throughout the world over the past 2,000 years, and it has thrived in America over the past two centuries. But what does the future hold for American Christianity? We asked Catholic, Protestant, and Evangelical experts eight questions about the future of Christian faith in America. Many of America's earliest colonies were created by men and women of Christian faith who wanted to practice their religion without government control or interference. That's why America's Constitution enshrined freedom of religion. Over the years, Americans have argued about what religious freedom means and how faith should be applied to creating a good and just society for all citizens. Along the way, they have debated the separation between church and state. They have argued over whether religion should be taught in public schools. They have also explored what role religious morality should play in law, public policy, and crime and punishment. In recent years, religion has played an important role in the way men and women run for president, and who gets nominated to the Supreme Court, and in whether government money can go to religious charities. It's a safe bet that such questions will continue in the future. The role that faith should play is the role that deep beliefs and commitments should play, which is to say they should find a form of public expression to the extent that these beliefs touch on issues of great public importance, civic importance at a given point in time. So at one point in time, it may be a war peace question. At another point in time, it may be a beginning of life question or an end of life question. At another point, it may be the health care debate. Is it a right of some kind? Is it an entitlement? Um, how do we try to guarantee access to it? Is a giant government program the way to do it? Or should there be more variety in how we approach it and so on? All of those are civic questions, common good questions. And on all of these questions, uh, religious believers have something to say. Change and experimentation have been hallmarks of American faith. At the same time, Christianity is a religion that continually points believers back to history and tradition. How can people of faith apply their beliefs to the world in ways that address new realities without forsaking the bottom line principles and practices that make them uniquely Christian? And how can adults introduce children and teens to the faith in ways that are relevant and guarantee the long-term survival of the church? American Christianity in general is tremendously fragmented and decentralized and uh, disunified, you might say, theologically. What comes with that is a challenge, if not a problem, of speaking with a coherent voice. What is Christianity? What is the gospel? This person says that, that pastor says the other thing. Uh, the message is spoken in so many tongues and so many accents that it's not entirely clear uh, what Christianity is in the end, I think, to a lot of people. There have been a lot of wise people who've encountered the issues of being human and being agents for the gospel before we did. So I th think that we ought to learn everything we can from wise Christians from the past. So that's tradition. Tradition has a very important place in the church. At the same time, we live in the present. We face conditions that are new and it takes creative thinking on our part. Race has been a difficult issue for Americans since the founding of the nation. In the beginning, Native Americans and millions of African slaves were oppressed. And ever since, people of color have struggled to find their place in the country's life and its churches. America has long been called a melting pot for immigrants from around the world. But others have called America a tossed salad in which various elements are mixed together without losing their distinctive flavor. Immigration continues today, but laws restrict how many people can come from which countries. Meanwhile, both church and state 
struggle with the issue of illegal immigration. What impact will immigration have on the future of the church? What are the Christian values that should guide our national debate about immigration? And how can America integrate people from around the world into its national life and religious life while maintaining a uniquely American culture? As more and more immigrant groups come in and as different races and ethnicities grow as a percentage of the population, the old sort of white Anglo dominance it becomes more and more um, implausible and, and numerically eventually won't even exist. And that forces churches, even in those historically white Anglo traditions, to come to grips with, well, how do we relate to Korean Presbyterians and Latino Pentecostals and um, Eastern European, you know, Orthodox? And it's just, how does that all work together? Are there ways to reach across ethnic differences to express any kind of religious solidarity or unity? My experience of the world growing up in the rural South has been so fundamentally different from that of my parents. Uh, I know I'm speaking about a very individual experience here, but the opportunities that have been thrown open to me, the gradual, definitely incremental changes that I see taking place in American churches, and just the general diversification of American life, it seems these issues have been thrust upon us in some ways, whether we welcome them or not, and we are in many ways being forced to confront those. So how we work on those issues, how we confront those issues will be the challenge of Christianity in the future. Christ Episcopal Church of Savannah, Georgia was founded 275 years ago, thanks to a land grant from King George II of England. In 2007, this historic congregation voted to leave its Episcopal diocese in the U.S. and put itself under the authority of a more conservative diocese in Uganda. The reason? Episcopal policies about the ordination of gays and lesbians. Homosexuality is not a new issue, but today people of faith are trying to balance the gospel's demands of grace and righteousness. Churches are also continuing to deal with issues of divorce, singleness, remarriage, and blended families as traditional forms of family life continue to evolve. Church leaders are not perfect or sinless. Accusations of sexual abuse have weakened the Catholic Church in America, and TV preachers have fallen from grace in public spectacles. Still, the question remains. What kind of communities do churches want to be as they seek to minister to people in a broken world? Uh, the question of human sexuality is so fraught uh, and so controversial because it touches every individual. Um, some people more than others, clearly, and at different points in their lives. Um, but no one escapes. That is, it, it involves all of us at one point or another. Um, so how the church or how churches handle this uh, is a fascinating question and it's one that I think because of changes in our culture uh, has become ever more exigent. That is, as we started to talk more and more about sexuality, in fact we can't stop talking about it, it's an absolute obsession among us, some churches have tended to go along with the free expression uh, idea to a great extent and then then that means they believe that the way to handle sexuality is to have sex education courses and to make sure that young people know about sexuality uh, understand that it's not something to be taken lightly but if they do get involved in sexuality there are certain things they need to do so on and so forth there are others who have drawn the line and said you know in fact if you're before you're married full sexual expression with other people is is not a good thing sexuality is too solemn and important an issue the way churches should wade into this it seems to me is always uh, from the stance of the dignity of the human person, how we understand that God-given dignity and what that lies, should always have before them the question of responsibility. Uh, to whom am I responsible? Before whom am I responsible? It's not so much a matter of just 
individual freedom. It's also a question of how we order certain powerful human tendencies. And I think if churches lose sight of that, then we've got a problem because then they're just becoming part of a kind of general cultural stream that doesn't want to talk about the issue of certain limits and the fact that we can't just do whatever we want at any point in time, whether it's sexuality or anything else. Over the last half century, many Americans became increasingly concerned about human impact on the environment. In recent decades, the question of global warming has made this an even more urgent and controversial issue, especially to people of Christian faith who are concerned with protecting the earth and loving its creator. According to United Nations estimates, the world's population will grow from today's 6.5 billion to 9 billion by the year 2050. All these people in a developing world will consume even more of the Earth's energy and other finite resources. Faith will undoubtedly play an important role in determining how we can change our lifestyles and policies to protect our world. The church is correct not to embrace environmentalism in the way it's often presented in the world, in the sense that the environment is not the central or controlling idea for the Christian in terms of the way we relate to life. In that sense, we're not ecocentric, we're theocentric. But the church needs to embrace the care of creation because it is a part of a much larger and more important theocentric purpose that God has for the world, which is its redemption. The creation is part of God's redemptive plan and purpose. And because that's true, in understanding what God is intending for the world, the church needs to be involved and cooperating with God's intention to redeem the world, just as the Bible teaches that he will. In 1993, Pope John Paul II urged believers to spread the culture of life over a culture of death. Catholics and other Christians have been at the forefront of efforts to limit abortion, the death penalty, and war. Theologians and activists have also battled over issues like embryonic stem cell research, euthanasia, and contraception. In the future, New debates will focus on the moral consequences of genetic engineering. What moral values should be applied to new forms of life that are developed in the laboratory? We live in a brave new world in which the rate of scientific change often outpaces our ethics and policies. What role should faith play in these complex and morally charged developments? As people of faith, we do have a responsibility to promote what the late John Paul II called a culture of life. Uh, that means, again, a deep and profound respect uh, for human life. Faced with the profundity of another living human being, our stance needs to be one of respect and recognition of the dignity of each of us in relation to the other. Um, and a culture of life means uh, that we never assume that there are such things as lives that are not worth living. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the anti-Nazi German theologian, says in his unfinished uh, ethics that there may be some lives that we look at and think they're quite wretched. Um, but those lives are still worth living before God. It's not for us to make a judgment on this. And one of the worries for the future is that we will become less tolerant of life in all its varieties, uh, that we will come to the view that we have so much control, you know, that we can manipulate genes and do all these different things in order to guarantee that certain unperfect types of human beings never again appear among us. And I think that's, that's a project that is uh, dangerous and it's sinful, and that means we're abandoning a culture of life in a, in a generous understanding of the term. Ah. 
Once upon a time, it was easier to ignore or tune out other religious traditions. But today, we live in a world of dizzying cultural and religious diversity. How are Christians to relate to people of other faiths? How can one be true to one's faith while also reaching out to people who have different or even no religious beliefs? And how can people of Christian faith stand for moral absolutes in an era of non-judgmentalism? How should Americans with Christian heritage relate to Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and people of other faiths both here and abroad? And in what way should churches reach out? What about evangelization in an increasingly pluralistic society? The motivating power of religion is in the strange and idiosyncratic stories we tell. The story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac. Uh, wow, that's a strange story. And yet we see something in that. Uh, that God's son dies, is killed, rises from the dead. That's very strange, very idiosyncratic. It's because of that that we are Christian and why we live. Um, and that's not going to match exactly what the Muslim thinks or the Hindu thinks or whatever. So on the one level, we, we live with them as fellow citizens and wherever what they get out of theirs that's good, we can relate positively. Our problem comes in when we use our distinctive story exclusively. I like to use the image of being hospitable, not tolerant. That means I got it figured out, I'll let you go. Hospitable is you're invited to my home. I'm not going to take down the cross of Jesus from the wall and the pictures of Jesus because you're a Jew and I'm a Christian. I may talk differently and you will listen differently and you will talk differently. We'll both learn from it. And I think that's what we do in the town square. That's what we do on campuses. That's what we do at the mall where the faith can bump into faith. Um, we be hospitable to each other. That is commanded. Uh, Israel, you must be friendly to the stranger, the alien, for you were once that. And uh, when we alienate the faith, we don't do the cross any good, the cause of the cross any good, and we don't convince people of anything. The people who came to America from other lands five centuries ago believed this new world was uniquely blessed. Using biblical imagery, Puritan leader John Winthrop referred to his new American colony as a city on a hill. For generations since, many American Christians have believed that the United States has a unique ordained role to play in the world. Do American Christians still believe that today? If so, what are the responsibilities we all have as citizens of this most Christian of Western nations? How can America's leaders promote its core values at home and abroad in ways that honor the things we say we believe while promoting the kind of global community that brings the most good to people throughout the world? And how does a nation like America with its historic Christian traditions interact with countries in the European Union where Christian faith is in decline, or Muslim countries where fundamentalist Islam is on the rise. Whether we are dealing with issues of economics and global trade, or issues of war and peace, how can Americans be true to what they say they believe? I have a very simple line of distinction. Wherever it is implicitly coerced through law, imposed by privilege of custom, so that those who aren't Christian or who are other kinds of Christians are made second-class citizens and have to squirm, we're in trouble. Wherever it is voluntary and persuasive, let her rip. It's very important that churches continue to maintain a strong identity separate from the state, that the freedom of the body of Christ on earth uh, as a corporate entity uh, is vitally important. It's not just a bunch of individual believers, but it's a body of a certain sort that has some purpose and integrity. Um, and to prepare people for the future, that needs to be emphasized. That it's not just me as a lone believer, sort of out there in the world, but as part of a body of a certain kind. 
These eight questions demand that we dig deep into our traditions and values as we seek to apply our faith to the challenges of our age. The challenges we face may seem daunting, but faith has guided us thus far through more than two centuries of American history. Christians ought to express their faith in public. They ought to be bold to show the love of Jesus Christ in their daily actions and when asked, to always be ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that is within them. But as the Apostle Peter says, to do that with gentleness and respect. I think to suggest that uh, the American nation ought to express Christian faith is asking it to do something that it was not designed to do and that um, its citizenry cannot agree to do. So I think the best posture for Christians in American public life today is to consider themselves missionaries. To say, here's a culture that has been influenced profoundly by Christianity through the years. Christianity has a place to be of positive influence yet today, but the nation does not either in formal terms or in consensus terms profess to be Christian. So we will be good witnesses in this nation. So instead of thinking that this is Christendom in the old European uh, uh, state-established church terms, to say this is missionary territory and to act accordingly. As long as you've got saints in each generation, the story goes on and it goes on with integrity. Uh, the rest of us fail so often that um, it's sometimes hard to see in parish life or church life, uh, very powerful manifestations of grace, but even there, of course, there are moments where it shines through unexpectedly and sometimes through the most broken members of the community. I think we can find many examples where Christian believers have made mistakes in how they've tried to bring their faith in, into public life. I've worked for many years on debates over slavery in the years before the American Civil War, and I think that almost everybody involved in that debate, whether they were abolitionists, pro-slave advocates, people in the middle, made considerable errors is how they went about trying to have a Christian influence in society. By the same token, I think there are many examples, however, uh, in American history where Christian people act, acting not only with zeal but also discretion made a real positive difference for, for the good. The civil rights movement, when there were strong Christian impulses, particularly in the African-American community, that basically said to Americans, you have a lot of these finely stated values, many of them actually rooted in Christian principles. How is it that they're not applied practically for consideration of how the races get along with, with e each other? Christianity that's influential in the American public, but that has lost its Christian dynamic, its Christian roots, is really not worth much at all. But what's also needed beside authentic Christian faith is wisdom as that, as that faith is, is put in, into use. And in, in our history, I think we have enough examples of how not to do it and enough examples of how to do it so that those who want to be active in the public today can learn a great deal from studying the past.